Oh, Father, how our hearts do yearn for that day when there will be no more study of war, no more war of conflict between nations, no more war between people, no more spiritual warfare because the evil one is completely vanquished and put away. We yearn for that day. Father, we pray that until that day, you would gird us up for the spiritual warfare that surrounds us every day. We pray until that day, you would enable us to be peacemakers of conflict between peoples and nations. And Father, we simply pray that Jesus will be recognized as the Lord of all, because then and only then will there be true peace. So help us, O oh Father, to be more like you in the attitudes of our heart and in our behaviors, to reflect accurately who you are to the world around us who knows that we stand for you and with you, and make us a people, Father, who can celebrate the glorious, glorious presence of the Prince of Peace every single day. In his precious and strong name we pray, amen and amen. We welcome you to this time of worship and praise on the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. It is a delight to be here uh, together in God's house, looking forward to not only our time of worship and adoration of him, but to his message to us. Our preacher for this day of Jesus and all that jazz week is the son of our Tuesday speaker. And he is such a better preacher than his dad. <laughs> he is so outstanding. I'll be sure and tell your dad I said that, Brother Greg. And I'll tell him you told me to say that. <laughs> Greg Wilton uh, is one of our grads. He did both his master's and doctoral degrees here at NOBTS. He spent several years in another country uh, in the Far East as a missionary of the IMB, had a wonderful ministry over there. He may talk some about that in his remarks. He's now serving at Long Hollow Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee, one of Tennessee's great churches, as their missions coordinator. I guess he does a little bit of everything. This is a wonderful church with church planting and mission efforts all over the United States, church planting and mission efforts all over the world. And they were very thrilled to be able to get an experienced missionary to come and lead their congregation uh, in that part of their congregational life. We are thrilled to have Dr. Wilton back home with us and ready to share God's word with us in just a few moments. So important for us to stand before God's word and let him speak to us. Would you please join me in standing for the reading of the word of God? Uh, Kyle Pieri is coming to lead us. Kyle, come on, which program are you in? Master of Divinity. Master of Divinity, and what are you reading today? Luke chapter six. Luke chapter six. Luke chapter 6, verse 43 through 49. A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. On the other hand, a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs aren't gathered from thorn bushes or grapes picked from a bramble bush. A good man produces good out of the storeroom of his heart. An evil man produces evil out of the evil storeroom. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. Why do you call me, Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood came and the river crashed against that house and couldn't shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The river crashed again against it and immediately it collapsed, and the destruction of the house was great. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Who dat? <laughs> yes! Love being back in New Orleans, and so grateful to be a part of this week, Jesus and all that jazz. I must confess, Dr. Kelly, we might need to revise the name and call it White Castle Week, in light of, for those of you who don't know, uh, I served as pastor of First Baptist Church in White Castle, Louisiana, and Kyle, who read scripture, is currently serving there as pastor of First Baptist White Castle, and we have some friends with us. In addition to that, my father was also a pastor there at First Baptist White Castle, so that is why, in essence, for us at least, those of us in the fraternity, we feel like it is a White Castle week right now. I am so glad, and I want to thank you so much for allowing me this privilege of being in my beloved school of providence and prayer as I get to share with you from God's word. I love this place. 
I absolutely love this place. I want to say thank you to Dr. Kelly and Dr. Rhonda, for Dr. Adam, the Dean of Chapel, and, and so many others for putting up with me in this seminary. I believe I counted at least 10 different places that I have lived on this seminary campus. I also served as a campus policeman, was a grader for both Dr. Taylor and for Dr. Pinkard, and there are so many memories that I have as a result of this place, and I can't thank you enough for allowing me to leave an impression maybe after today that is not just the no bikes in the quad sign <laughs> that you have there. Because growing up as a kid, my brother Rob and I are convinced that there is a no bicycles on the quad sign somewhere around here because we used to do that as children all the time when we were around here. I want to invite you to open up the word to Acts chapter 20, verse 17 through 18. For the purpose of the title of my message, today I'm going to be preaching from the English Standard Version, and the title of my message today is, We Must Not Shrink Back. Let's read. I'd like you to, as we read, remember verse 20 and also verse 27. It is said a little bit differently in the other translations. In the English Standard Version, it uses the language of not shrinking back. So we begin in Acts chapter 20 and verse 17, and it reads, Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course. And the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you. Verse 27, I preached this March 8, 2013 in White Castle. I know this because this is the verse that I gave to my third born son, Oliver. Verse 27, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him. 
being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. The title of my message is We Must Not Shrink Back. Have you ever found yourself in a situation in which you wanted to act courageously, yet you acted like a coward? I remember that moment for me as a seminary student. I was privileged to participate with, some of you know him, Mel Jones, and he invited me into his world and allowed me to go and have some Bible studies and help out with some Bible studies just right across the street made some great connections and friendships with some of the individuals there. I have no idea, but in the process, I got my car stolen. And it was from one of my friends who was in that ministry at the time. Some of the professors here know that experience full well. Well, Mel Jones got me into a van. And he and I started to go throughout the city of New Orleans. And he was just praying in the spirit and asking that God would show us where my forerunner is. We took random turns throughout the city, and we went to this one particular part of town. You guys have heard of it before, Fat City. We went to a place, and I watched him as he began to interrogate a man in the corner of this, this apartment complex, and it got a little bit hostile, and it got a little bit, little bit heated, and I started to shrink just a little bit. We finally made our way to another part of the city, because he had been able to locate my forerunner. We walk into this place, into this house, and we recognize that there are drugs all over the counters. There is a man, I kid you not, with a gun that is tucked into his front belt. Like, what what you putting a gun right there for? That doesn't make sense. Okay, you get me nervous. We begin to ask for my vehicle and... These guys start to make fun of us a little bit. And Mel, if you guys know Mel, some of you know Mel very well, he all of a sudden just got really big for all of a sudden he said, don't mess with me, I live this life. And I'm going, I I didn't live this life. (laughs) And I I was terrified for a moment. And, And Mel, just amazing man of God for him to be able to use that moment, not only to redeem the moment, to get my vehicle back, but also to lead one of those men to Christ in that very moment. Isn't it amazing when we see acts of courage, especially in light of sometimes when we act cowardly? We're in desperate need of courage today, aren't we, friends? In particular, we are in desperate need of courageous men and women of the cross. For the sake of the world, for the sake of the church, we need courageous men and women of the cross. And the need today for courageous Christians is as great as it was in Paul's day, was it not? After we just read this passage of scripture. This idea that we are seeing from Acts 20, 17 through 38, we ultimately see this. Paul encourages the Ephesian elders through his example and through exhortations. We see that he calls for these elders. This is his third major public speech in the book of Acts. This is, by the way, the only speech in essence that is made exclusively to Christians. And he is preparing the church, particularly the church in Ephesus, for his departure, for his absence. The kind of the same way that Jesus does before departing from his apostles. And this is very applicable, not just to the Ephesian elders, but to the church in general. So what we want to do if this is what's taking place, Paul encouraging the Ephesian elders through his example and through exhortations, why don't we take a look right now at some of his examples? And then let's look at some of his exhortations in Scripture. Well, when I was studying this and I was coming across this, I I counted at least 14, at least 14 different examples Paul exampling and exemplifying what it means to live as a courageous follower of Jesus. 
for the sake of time today, I just want to give you five of them. I could go through all of them, but let's just look at just five examples that Paul mentions in how he is sharing with the Ephesian elders. The first one right here, look at what he says in verse 18. Lived among you the whole time. What an example that the Apostle Paul sets, right? Paul the Apostle is not one who is, in essence, going and ministering and then having nothing to do with them apart from just a moment of ministry. In accordance with his example, we see the practice of incarnational living. We see that, what does it say? Verse 18, lived among you the whole time. In other words, the way that Tim Keller describes about Jesus, that he took on flesh and he moved into a bad neighborhood. It may, not have, may or may not have been a bad neighborhood, but we do know this. We do know that Paul, through his example, is demonstrating to the Ephesian elders, I lived with you. I ate with you. I drank with you. I fellowshiped with you. And this is so important because examples are enriching to our soul because we see it in others. It draws us to Jesus and it makes us want to follow their example. That's one. The second one, if you just look to the next verse, it says, serving the Lord with all humility, tears, and trials. There's another example. Dr. Kelly, I will never forget one of his messages as one of the semester started for me as a student. He was up here and he was welcoming the students as they were showing up for a, another semester for me. For some, it was a, a new semester for students. And I'll never forget, I was actually sitting in the very back. In the very back, and Dr. Kelly looked at all the students here. He says, why are you here? What are you here to do? And I'll never forget as a seminary student, well, should I be a youth minister? Should I be a missionary? Should I be a pastor? What is it that I'm going to do? And yet I will never forget, and it has stuck with me to this day, that I am not called to a position, friends. I am called to what? A person. I'm called to the Lord Jesus. And I'll never forget that example, that exhortation that Dr. Kelly gave to us, that one particular chapel service. And we see the example here that the Apostle Paul is providing us in verse 19. Because he says he is not serving the Ephesian elders. If you look at the text, he says he is serving the Lord. That in his ministry, he makes it his aim and his ambition, yes, to do everything possible to serve the Ephesian elders, but ultimately to be about the business of serving the Lord. Man, I, I find it enriching Paul's example. We have a third example that we could take a look at right now. And we just look at the next verse. Because the next verse in verse 20, it says, look, teaching in public and from house to house. I love that. I love reading that and recognizing that Paul is saying, I only speak to a crowd when there's 5,000. I only speak to a crowd when it advances my career. What we recognize in the Apostle Paul and his example is that he is not only teaching in public, which, by the way, you guys know can be a very scary thing, but he's also teaching from house to house. And, that, you know, that's what I love about my dad. He was here. He was preaching on Tuesday. And I'm just getting to text with him and talk with him on a weekly basis. And I know this about my father. He gets as excited about preaching to 10 as he does to 10,000. And that's why I love to look at him as my example, my role model. Can I just say a word of encouragement to some of you here? Keep going. Keep going and find deep, abiding joy in having an opportunity to proclaim to whoever is in front of you. It doesn't matter if it's just one doesn't matter if it's 10. It doesn't even matter if it's 10,000. We have the joy of serving the Lord and teaching in public and from house to house. Thank you, Apostle Paul, for writing this and saying this to the Ephesian elders. The fourth one, this is good. This is good. Verse 21, it says, testifying, but what? <laughs> 
to both Jews and Greeks. Jews and Greeks. You see his impartiality. You see his inclusivism in those whom he is targeting. He is not going around and he has demonstrated to the Ephesian elders that, oh no, I'm only going to preach to the Jews. Or I'm only going to preach to the Greeks. Isn't it a wonderful encouragement through his example that he testifies to both? And my friends, I hope that we can testify to one another as well. And looking at Paul's example and just saying, are we doing the same thing? There's a guy by the name of Trip Lee who I just heard of recently, and he says, if you find yourself hanging out with the same people all the time, you got a problem, especially if you're a Christian. Because we see, at least through Paul's example, that he's testifying to both Jews and to Greeks. That's rich. I don't know about you, but that's an encouragement that I must not shrink back. We have a fifth one here, and I told you there's at least 14, but we'll, for the sake of the examples, let's just stop here and look at this one that shows up in verse 22. If you'll reminded, be reminded in the text that Paul loves using this language. The language is he's constrained by the Spirit. Now, that's a powerful thought if you really think about it. Those of us who follow the Lord Jesus and have the Holy Spirit of God, the imputed righteousness of God within us, and we have the Holy Spirit abiding in us. And Paul uses the language, in fact, it's used right here, constrained by the Spirit, but there are some times where he's compelled by the Spirit. And I look at a man like the Apostle Paul and I say, thank you so much for remembering to say this to the Ephesian elders about your example. That there are some times where you're constrained by the Spirit and it just looks good, it feels good, it should be the thing that you do, and yet because you want to be Spirit-filled, you don't go that direction. We have so many students here and we are going to be presented with so many different opportunities. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I move to this state? Should I start a new work? Should I encourage an older work? And we're going to feel this tension the entire time. And the Apostle Paul is reminding us to be constrained by the Spirit. And to do that which the Spirit guides us and helps us and convicts us to do in accordance with the Holy Word of God. Wow, so many different examples. Verse 24, I count my life of any value or no, nor as precious to myself. Also, verse 24, if I only may finish my course and my ministry, what an example. Testify to the gospel of God's grace. On and on it goes, even all the way down to verse 36, where we see his example, friends, that he knelt down and prayed with them. And the encouragement that the Ephesian elders received because at that moment he decided to kneel down with them and to pray with them and to weep alongside of them. And I just read that and I just want to really reflect personally as I hope that you do in your context right now and ask you to consider when is the last time you have wept with others for the sake of the gospel? What a precious example here. You know, there's something inspiring and refreshing and encouraging about having a great role model, isn't it? It's really refreshing. It's really an inspiration. I'll never forget my beautiful wife, Abby, and I. We come up to the president's home, and we're about to have some sort of meeting together. I, I don't remember exactly, Abby, what we were about to do, but you and I are sitting at the are standing at the front door, we ring the doorbell, and Dr. Kelly walks right on up and begins to welcome us on in. I decide to say this, Dr. Kelly, doesn't my wife look lovely today? And Dr. Kelly, he said, you were doing so well, Greg, until that last word. <laughs> and in typical Dr. Kelly function, just smiling, and shaking his head. <laughs> he says, Greg, let's, let's back up a little bit. Let's back up a little bit. Do you mean that she looks lovely just today? 
Do you mean she didn't look lovely yesterday? What about tomorrow? Are you going to be able to sustain that and say that on a continual basis, that she looks lovely today, 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 for the rest of your life? No, 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 let's back up just a little bit. So he gives me a lesson right there on the front steps of the president home, and he says, let's, let's try this again. So we're having a good time, and my wife and I, and I just looked at her, and I said, Dr. Kelly, doesn't my wife look lovely? And he's saying, there you go. <laughs> there you go. I want to remind us of the important, importance of having great role models in our lives. Those who encourage us, who lift us up, who share the appropriate word when we need it, who do not even at times shrink back when you need to hear something, though it could be really, really difficult for you to receive at times. It's important for us to see how wonderful it is that Paul is exemplifying this to the Ephesian elders. It's wonderful. That was encouragement through his example, but what? What of his exhortations? So we see that Paul is encouraging the Ephesian elders through his, his example, and through his exhortations. Well, clearly there are two. There are two exhortations, and it's kind of almost saying the same thing. If you take a look at verse 28, we see the first exhortation, right? And the first exhortation is pay careful attention. Verse 28, it reads, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Paul's encouraging them. He says, pay attention. Be alert, as he's about to say. Now, living in Southeast Asia, it's wonderful because there's, in our city where we were for a couple of years, there are as many Starbucks in our city as there were in New Orleans or Nashville or any other place. But there are also malls, and some of you who love malls, Dr. Taylor has been there. If you love malls, then the city that we were living in, that's the place for you. But not when you have four kids. When you have four kids and the masses of humanity, it's just people everywhere. My wife and I have to pay careful attention because we got these kids that just want to go all over the place. We got these kids that just want to run all over the place and they just want to enjoy. Oh, what's that candy? What's that thing? What can I break? And we have to pay careful attention. This is, in essence, the kind of image, the kind of at least language that the Apostle Paul is giving to the Ephesian elders. Pay careful attention. In the second exhortation, which is one and the same, it's verse 31, which is what? What does it say? Be alert. Be alert. Because, you know, we have quite an epidemic today, right? And that's people who are texting while driving. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. And you can see it at night, can you not? You can see the glares of the screens at night when you're passing people by. And you just want to say, put up the phone. But then you're doing it as well. And then you can watch people as they kind of slowly swerve. And you can see that they're really not concentrating because you can see how their car is kind of moving in the interstate or the roads. And really and truly today you have to be as alert as you possibly can when you're driving, not just defensive driving, but offensive driving, just making sure that you don't get into an accident. Guys, and all it takes is one split second. How much more true is it of our walks with the Lord Jesus? How much more true is it when we just decide to put our guard down? for just a solitary second, just one simple second. You've heard it said you can take a lifetime to build up your character, but you can lose your, lose your reputation in one moment. And do you see what the Apostle Paul is exhorting them to do, to pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock, to be alert? Why does he do that? Well, we see very clearly in verse 29, right? Take a look at verse 29, right? Fierce, what? Wolves. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in 
among you, not sparing the flock. Yet he also exhorts them, yes, because of fierce wolves who come in, the people who are a part of themselves and are going to corrupt the flock, the, the, the people of God. But in another way, we see also Paul's ambition, which should drive us back to those two verses that I wanted to share with you at the beginning, verse 20 and verse 27. If I could summarize the Apostle Paul's ambition for the Ephesian elders and the churches they serve, I would say very carefully, I pray that you listen to this. He's exhorting them. He has an ambition. He has a concern for evangelism and discipleship. In other words, preaching and teaching. Another way of saying it that Paul is exhorting these elders Fruitfulness and faithfulness, proclamation and preservation, evangelism and discipleship, let's use those two terms, are his major concerns for the Ephesian elders. And this is why I must exhort us today, my friends, no matter what way you came into this precious, beloved chapel, that we must not shrink back. We must not shrink back. ESV uses that language of not shrinking back. The NIV talks about you should not hesitate. The CSB says you should not avoid. Avoid what? Not hesitate doing what? Not shrinking back from doing what? Verse 20 and 21, evangelism. He says, for I did not shrink back from declaring. Declaring what? Anything that was profitable. The good news that we should also not shrink back. Look at verse 27. I love that phrase. We had a little conversation about it with my friends before the, before the chapel service. We should not shrink back from declaring what? The whole counsel of God. And I want to say this, guys. It takes courage deep. God-given courage to not shrink back, but to continue with evangelism and discipleship. It takes tremendous courage to spread, and it takes tremendous courage to preserve. I was just recently in northern Iraq, also known as Kurdistan, just two months back. And I had the joy and privilege of seeing 17 Muslim background believers baptized in a public pool. And this particular movement, I was looking at the leader, I was looking at these people, and they were being baptized in a public pool where there were other Muslims in that area watching and observing what these new believers were doing. I met two guys who were former terrorists and are now following Jesus. I can show you their picture. I met this couple who had just recently fled from another part of Iraq because they were receiving death threats from her family. And while holding their little child and handing the child off for the moment of baptism, this couple, this husband and wife, in the presence of other people, declared through baptism that Jesus is Lord and I want to follow him. And I use that as an example of northern Iraq. But I want to tell all of us very clearly and very plainly that this world wants us to shrink back. This world, even in the context that you find yourself right now, they are trying to, at every single turn, discourage you from proclaiming Jesus as Christ, as Savior, as Lord. And it's a real reality. It's a real reality in the Bible belt of America that people would rather us just not speak up about who we believe to be the only hope of the world but discipleship as well it takes courage for discipleship friends even right now my dear wife Abby is dealing with issues related to people whom she is discipling where they want to get her to make small concessions two examples one individual doesn't want them to read the word as much 
Can we just get together and just kind of talk? Do we have to go to this all the time? And there's that, that, that small concession that people are wanting to make with regard to discipleship. Another example, we just hosted Secret Church at Long Hollow. The live one. They talked about cults and counterfeit gospels. And Abby experiencing a conversation just after it. And someone wishing to just, Abby, would you just please? Mormons are Christians. They are. God's grace is enough for them. They are. Don't have to be so dogmatic about things. They follow Jesus too. And friends, is it not true, the conversations that you are having, even this week, this past week, of all the time, people wanting to really just prevent us from, not, from really being courageous when it comes to evangelism and discipleship. So this is where I have to conclude, friends. I want to conclude by just saying this. I have no other way to close except to say that we must exhort one another to never shrink back from evangelizing and discipling others because Jesus is worth it. He is so worth it. There is only one who's qualified to save us from our sins. There is only one who could take not only my sins, past, present, and future, but he could also take on the sins of the world that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He is worth it. And for this reason, we must not shrink back. We must hear Hebrews 10, 39. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. I want us to pray for one another. I want us to pray for one another that we don't shrink back especially with regard to evangelism and discipleship. In Southeast Asia, a dear friend of mine was abducted on February 13th, around 10.30 in the morning, broad daylight, and that was in 2017 of February. This man loved Jesus with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. A man I affectionately called Uncle Raymond. And we have not heard from him since. Masked men, five vehicles, motorcycles, pulled up, slammed into his car, pulled him out, and we have not seen from him since. Jonathan, I want to invite you to come on up here, brother. Stand next to me. This is his son. This is my friend, Jonathan. And right now, not only in Southeast Asia, but all across the world, there are people where the world would just want us to really shrink back. Just act like cowardly. And if anyone has a right to do so, It'd be the people from where he comes from. And yet, Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. And I want to do something as we close. I want us to close just in prayer because we need it. Guys, we, we don't have the courage. We need Jesus. We need the Spirit. We need God to fill us up and make us courageous. We are not courageous on our own merit. We need the Lord Jesus to make us brave. So I want us to leave from this place in a spirit of prayer for one another. That we pray for Jonathan, but we would pray for one another as well. Dr. Kelly, would you come on up here? Would you come on up here and, and close this time as, as Dr. Kelly leads us? He's going to lead us into a time of prayer not only for Jonathan, for the people there that they would not shrink back, but that we likely would also not shrink back in partnering with what God is doing all around the world 
to share and proclaim this good news and to disciple the nations beginning here in New Orleans. Would you lead us in a closing time of prayer? Heavenly Father, we come into your presence and we lift up Jonathan and his family and his father. We do not know where his father is, but we do know where he is. He's in your grip. He is in your presence. And we pray, Father, if he is in your presence and somewhere in that nation in difficult circumstances that you would bring to him sunshine and light, encouragement, and a sense of your presence. If he is with you in glory, that you would, Father, be pouring out on him that which he so richly deserves for his sacrificial service. And in my mind's eye, Father, I am, I am at midnight in a boy's school in the city of Kuala Lumpur, smuggled in to a darkened room, not a light going, a room filled with boys, and someone whispered in my ear, you can talk now, but talk softly. And sharing the gospel in a dark room at midnight, smuggled in, smuggled out for fear of consequences, and realizing there is no safe road to following Jesus. We made sacrifices to come to seminary, but what do those look like next to the sacrifices that Jonathan's family are making? The greatest sacrifice to make is the one immediately in front of us. Doesn't matter how hard anybody else's sacrifice is. Doesn't matter if there's a bigger one down the road. The only sacrifice that matters is the one right in front of us. For there is that moment Will I take that step, this step, the one in front of me? We thank you for the witness of Scripture to your people who obeyed with such courage and faith. We thank you for the testimony of Christian history and all who have followed you through the ages who have been at that, at that moment. And we stand, Father, today knowing there are men and women perhaps even some of us in this place who are staring at a sacrifice that seems too great to make. <clears throat> Fill us, Father, with the faith we cannot produce ourselves. As we cast ourselves before you in love, Father, we surrender ourselves to you. And we pray that in those moments of truth, moments of truth that reveal where we really are with you, that you would help us to discover how great your strength is, how great your mercy is, how great your help is. So, Father, we don't want fame. We don't want great reputations. We don't want to be men and women of history. We just want to be faithful. And I will never forget that night when they pulled me out of the car and they said, now we smuggle you inside. And we hope we come out. Thank you for all those believers all over this world who in that moment say, yes, Jesus, yes. May that be on our lips. And may you bear up, Father, all of those who are facing those moments right now. In the precious and the mighty name of Jesus, we pray.